are not shadows on this wall. It's just only got one coat, so it's just the gray bleeding through. So uh, you're looking going, man, there's a lot of shadows up there. No, there's just it needs a second coat bad, and uh, we couldn't get to it today. So we were trying to have the choir loft all done today and uh, have all the front done, but there's a bunch of touch-ups we have to do and uh, just stuff like that. So we'll probably do that Friday. Try to have the choir loft all done by Sunday, and uh, then next week the goal will be to paint the rest of the walls uh, in here and um, brightening it up a little bit. Not dramatic changes, just brightening it up. I always felt like when I was up in a choir, I couldn't see the music. It was so dark up there. And uh, it's going to be a touch lighter, and that might save us a little money on putting brighter lights in up there. So uh, a little bit of paint can go a long way. All right, well, we are going to open with a word of prayer, and then we're going to pick it up in Revelation chapter 6 again tonight. I'm going to do a quick review as I have been just to bring everybody up to speed and if you've not uh, if you're watching online you've not watched the first four videos uh, tonight you'll be questioning some things so go back and uh, go back and do that I don't have time to reteach every lesson by the time I get to lesson eight or nine it would take three hours to to lay all that groundwork again. So let's go to the Lord in prayer and be in Revelation chapter 6. Father, we thank you for the day and thank you for all the work that's been accomplished. And Lord, as we gather tonight, we pray that you bless our time. Give me wisdom uh, in teaching what your word teaches. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Well, I am going to, let me uh, get ahead in my notes a little bit. We'll go through a, uh, a little brief review, and then basically tonight I am going to, um, I don't want to say my best effort, uh, I'm going to open the Bible and I'm going to shoot down some very common tribulation theology, uh, and I'm going to blow it out of the water, I think. When, by the time you're done, you'll go, oh yeah, that couldn't possibly be once I, you think it through. Okay, so we got the study of the end times. Uh, we said, uh, of course, we set the precedence for that, Enoch and Elijah, uh, Elijah, those are not, uh, the rapture is not a new concept that's only going to take place in the future, it's happened in the past in a different form. Uh, Daniel's 70-week vision is the, uh, is the foundation for our understanding of the tribulation and, and eschatology. The 70-week vision he had, it was 490-year period of time broken into three distinct periods. The first seven weeks, or 49 years, dealt with from the decree to rebuild Jerusalem to the completing of the street. Uh, the 62 weeks were from that point until Messiah be cut off, which gets us to, uh, in my opinion, gets us to around 29 AD, which is when I believe Christ died, based on the studies that I have done. Uh, and then the last week, or seven years, is what we call the tribulation. And in between the 62 weeks and the one week, is the church age. The church age was not on the Old Testament prophetic calendar because the prophets could not see the church age. God did not allow them to see it because they were focused on Israel and the prophecies that they gave were Israel focused. They were not church focused, okay? So that's why you have this gap between the first, uh, first 483 years until this is the church age is in between there from the time Messiah is cut off until the church age is completed, then we go back to an Old Testament prophetic calendar. Prophetic calendar. I keep saying prophetic. Um, prophetic. Pronounce it correctly. We talked about the three people groups. When we're dealing with prophecy, there are only three people groups. There's the Jew, which are the descendants of Abraham through Jacob, the Gentiles, which is every other ethnic group on planet Earth, and the church, the church of God, which is, are all those who are saved. So if you're saved here tonight, you're part of the third group. If you're not saved and you're not a Jew, then you're a Gentile. If you're not saved and you aren't a Gentile, then you're a Jew. We all fit into one of these three categories, and, uh, and it's important we keep them distinct or we have problems in our eschatology. Uh, Israel is the object of the tribulation. <laughs> Okay, this, this is all important stuff. I, I'm going to harp on it because uh, if we don't have this down, if we don't understand this, error can creep in and false teaching and confusion can creep in. Israel is the object of the tribulation according to Daniel chapter 9. Uh, it says uh, this vision, upon thy people, upon thy holy city, and then Jeremiah 37, Jacob's trouble. We're not of Jacob, we're the church. Okay? Israel in the tribulation, 
Daniel 9, what is the purpose of the tribulation? The tribulation is not just so God can throw a temper tantrum. No, the tribulation is about God restoring Israel back into the right, the covenant relationship that he made with them. He made three covenants with Israel, one through Abraham, one through Moses, and one through David. We don't have time to cover all three of those covenants, but those are the covenants that God made with Israel. And it's on the basis of those covenants that he is not done with Israel. And the church has not replaced Israel. Okay? Replacement theology is garbage. Finish the... The purpose stated in Daniel chapter 9 is to finish the transgression, make an end of sins, make reconciliation, again, all about Israel, bring everlasting righteousness, seal up the vision of prophecy, meaning put a period to all of that concerning Israel, and then to anoint the most holy, which will take place when he comes back the second time and he goes into Jerusalem and he sits on the throne of his father, David. He will be anointed most holy, and he will rule for a thousand years. We'll cover the millennial kingdom eventually. So let's go back to the rapture. What does the rapture do? The rapture ushers in the Antichrist. The Bible says in 2 Thessalonians there must be a falling away first. This is what makes the Antichrist acceptance possible. I believe the falling away is, is beginning in a, uh, in a way. Um, it's happening now. There's a growing apostasy among within Christianity, but there's also a falling away of truth in general among, in the world. Okay? Uh, there's just a, a, a willingness to accept whatever they're told and, and don't believe your lying eyes. Believe me. Okay, that's conditioning for the Antichrist because that's what the Antichrist is going to do. He's going to say, don't believe your lying eyes, trust me. And people are going to say, okay. Um, so the Antichrist cannot be revealed until the restrainer is removed. Who is the restrainer? Yeah, the Holy Spirit of God who dwells within us. When he is taken out of the way, not when he steps aside, but when he's taken out of the way. Well, the word rapture means to catch away. We are going to be harpazo. We are going to be caught away, caught up together with them in the cloud. Okay, the Holy Spirit is going to be taken when we are caught up. Thus, the Antichrist will then be able to come on the scene. Second Thessalonians chapter 2, again, this is all review. We've covered this in detail. Go back and watch the first four episodes. I'm going to just call them episodes for lack of anything else. Makes me feel important to say I have episodes. Uh, my wife will tell you I have episodes, but they're not online. <laughs> Okay, the Antichrist is revealed at the start of the tribulation. This is the sequence of events that, that undercuts the mid-trib and post-trib doctrine, false doctrine in my opinion, because the Antichrist can't come on the scene till the, the Holy Spirit's taken out of the way. The Holy Spirit can't be taken out of the way till the church is taken out of the way. So the rapture happens, the Holy Spirit is gone, the Antichrist comes on the scene, and both Daniel 9 and Revelation 6 tells the first thing that happens in the tribulation is the Antichrist comes on the scene. Okay, so you, you can't have the Antichrist with the church here, and you can't have the tribulation without the Antichrist. So if you get those landmarks down, you know, the Bible says don't move the ancient landmarks, don't move the old landmark. You know, they used to put pillars on the corners of their property, and it was, it was a serious offense to move those stones marking people's property. So once those landmarks are established, you know, it's like when you're getting to know a new city. If you... If you pick out a few landmarks and you know where those are, then you start to fill in the gaps in between. Okay, that's how you interpret scripture. You have some landmarks and then you fill everything in between. If you try to fill in without the landmarks, you're gonna be in, you're gonna be in Timbuktu when you should be in Poughkeepsie, okay? So the rapture removes the church. The rapture is also the resurrection from the dead for the dead in Christ, okay? We which are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and 1 Corinthians 15. When, when the rapture happens, we will put off our corruptible and mortal selves and we will be changed in the twinkling of an eye in a moment, be changed into incorruptible, immortal beings, 1 Corinthians 15, and that's well established. That's the rapture, okay? So now uh, we get to, last week we covered the first four sealed judgments in Revelation chapter 6. Revelation 6, 1 and 2. White horse and rider, the rider's the Antichrist. What's the first thing that happens when God starts the tribulation? <laughs> Here comes the Antichrist, okay? 
It's not midway through the tribulation, and you can't have the Antichrist unless the Holy Spirit's gone. You can't have the Holy Spirit gone unless the church is gone. It's just that simple. He comes to power through diplomacy and deception. That's why he has a bow and no arrow. Second seal we covered last week, the red horse and rider. Red equals blood and violence. There's going to be global warfare, conflict, not even necessarily nation among nation. That will be part of it. But just a, I mean, there'll just be gangs and tribes and all of that get together and just murder other people. It happens in the world now, and it's been happening in the world since Christ left and said, I'm coming again, and these things mark the end times. We've been in the end times since Jesus said, I'm going away, and he got caught up in the clouds. That's we're, Everything from the ascension of Christ until time is no more is considered the end times, okay? We are in the end times. We, Paul was in the end times. Peter was in the end times. Alexander the Great, you know, you can stick them wherever. I don't care who you, we're, we're in the end times. Okay, but there's going to be a global warfare, violent conflict. Black horse and rider comes third, third seal. Um, uh, the black talks about famine and death. The rider has a set of scales. Uh, a day's wage will buy a, enough wheat for one man to eat for a day. So um, that's, that's, that's pretty high inflation. Um, but the oil and the wine are not to be touched. The oil and the wine, uh, among other things, also talk about healing. Uh, the good Samaritan, when he picked up the guy who was almost beaten to death, the Bible says he tended to his wounds and he poured in oil and wine, okay, indicating that he was healing him, medicinal purposes, and uh, then took him to the inn. The fourth seal is the pale horse and rider. The totality of the first four seals, which seem to kind of overlap and kind of happen as a clump, is one quarter of the Earth's population will die in probably the first year, maybe year and a half of the tribulation through sword, through hunger, through death, through wild beasts. Uh, and, uh, you know, there's, for easy math, Eight billion people in the world, a quarter of the Earth's population is two billion people. So within about a year and a half, about two billion people will die. Uh, world War II lasted seven years, and about 100 million people died. It was about four and a half percent of the Earth's population. So if you condense World War One or World War II into one, one year, maybe a year and a half, and then multiply that by five, that's what's going to happen. So in seven years of World War, about 100 million died, 4.5% of the Earth's population at the time. So multiply that by five, and then condense that from seven years down to one, maybe two. And now you understand the death rate, okay? So bad, 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 and this is the easy stuff. It really only gets worse, okay? So now we come to the fifth seal, Revelation chapter 6, and we'll pick it up in verse 9. And uh, we'll go through uh, this tonight. We're not going to get in past the seal judgments tonight. Verse, um, verse 9, it says, And when he had opened the fifth seal, again, that's the Lamb, Jesus Christ. He's the one opening the seals. When he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? And white robes were given unto every one of them, and it was said unto them that they should rest yet for a little season, until their fellow servants also and their brethren that should be killed as they were should be fulfilled. And behold, when, I, uh, when he had opened the sixth seal... Okay, so we'll quit in verse 11. Okay, so what everybody interprets this, of course it is, it is under the altar. John's seeing this in heaven. He's seeing the souls of those who had been martyred for their, for their testimony and for the word of God gathered there under the altar. And they were saying, Lord, how long before you, you take vengeance for what was done to us? You say, well, that doesn't sound like a very Christian prayer request. No, what did God say? He said, vengeance is mine. I will repay, saith the Lord. That's what he said. So he's made a promise, and these souls are only asking him, how long until you keep your promise? You said you would repay, and that vengeance is yours, and that's what they're crying for. They're crying for vengeance, for their blood being shed for the word of God and for the testimony that they held. Okay? So it's all perfectly reasonable. 
So now, here's where the problem comes in. And we're going to try to shoot this out of the water because I don't think it's scriptural. And I'm going to show you why in scripture I don't think it is. This always gets interpreted as these are people getting saved in the tribulation and then being killed for their faith in Christ. And that there are more yet to come, and that's why we're waiting until all of the people are going to be martyred for the word of God and their testimony. We're waiting for all of them to finish getting martyred, and then when it's done, then I'm going to deal with it. Which I believe, by the halfway point of the tribulation, it is all completed, and then one of the plagues in the second half of the tribulation is specifically said to be God's vengeance. You shed blood, so he turns the water into blood and he turns all the fresh water into blood, and he leaves them without, and he said, okay, you, you wanted blood? Here's your blood, and this is for all the people that you killed for the word of God and the testimony they held. So I'm turning all this water to blood. You'll have nothing, no water to drink. You'll have nothing but blood and all your fresh water. Okay, that's what God does in, in vengeance upon them. Sends them blistering heat and then takes away their water. That's, that's a pretty good one. I think, I think that'd be all right with me. We want everything to be quick. God says, no, we'll just slow it down a little bit. Okay, so are these, are these tribulation saints? The Bible says they're given white robes. Okay, the white robes, we don't have time to get into it. Study the parables Jesus taught. The white robes are their wedding garments. Just study Jesus' parables, what he talked about when he talked about weddings. Okay, those are all prophetic. They're prophetic parables, every single one of them. Explains things about Israel and explains things about the rapture. Told them to wait until the rest of the martyr uh, join them. Are these souls of the tribulation saints that were martyred in the first part of the tribulation? Every book I have on my shelf about Revelation says yes. Based on my study of the Bible, the Bible says no. And I think everybody who's got that in their books, they got that from somebody else's book who got it from somebody else's book who got it eventually all the way back. You find one person who had a hypothesis and everyone said, oh, that sounds good because we're too lazy to actually research the scripture and find out who they are. So we, we go with the easy explanation. It saves us a lot of study time. Okay, I know I'm not being nice. Are there tribulation saints? There are four questions I'm going to ask you, and we're going to try to answer them tonight to help determine the identity of these souls. Questions are the way, you know, you have to ask questions. Who, what, when, who, what, when, why, how, you know, these are questions that any thinking person asks when they don't understand something. And that's how you get an answer. We're programmed to ask questions. That's why when your kids learn to talk, the first two words that they love the most are no and why. <laughs> you know, why, 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 why? And eventually, you know, the smart answer is because I said so. You know, <laughs> I'm done answering why. Why do I have to make my bed? Because I said so. Why do I have to do this? Because you're going to get a spanking if you don't. Um, so we're going to ask these four questions. Number one. Who is God dealing with? We are in the tribulation period in Revelation chapter 6. Who is God dealing with in the tribulation? Yeah, he's dealing with Israel. Have we not established this fact already? This, again, this is why I laid this foundation. God is not dealing with the church, is he? No. God's not even dealing with the Gentiles, is he? So who's, what's the, who's the object of the tribulation? Well, we've already looked at that, that the answer is it's Israel. It's the Jews. Okay? Uh, the church of God has been raptured. And by the way, at the rapture, the church's membership is complete. Jesus didn't rapture part of his bride. He raptured all of his bride. The Gentiles were given the chance to be grafted in through Christ. They rejected God's offer, and now they are no longer under the grace of God. They are under the wrath of God. In 2 Thessalonians, when we covered this passage, the Bible says that God himself would send them strong delusion that they would, should believe a lie that they all might be damned. Who is he talking to in Thessalonians? He's talking to the church about Gentiles. 
Because God's purpose and covenant with Israel does not allow for them to all be damned. So he can only be talking about, he's talking to the church about the Gentiles because they believe not the truth. God gave them a chance to get in on it. They said no. He says, okay, fine. You, want, you don't want the truth, you want to lie? I will make you believe a lie so that you go down in flames with your buddy, the Antichrist. I'll send you somebody that you will believe and they will put your faith in and he is going to take you to hell because you had the truth and you rejected it. Okay? And then the Jew, who is the focus of the tribulation, it's, it, the, the, the purpose of the tribulation, as we saw, was for the restoration of the covenant relationship with Israel. God is not trying to destroy Israel. He's trying to restore. He's chastening Israel to the place where they say, okay, we've had enough. We will repent and we will come back and we will flee to you. And we have no other choice. We can die or we can and flee as God instructed us to and put our faith and trust in what God has promised us. That's, what he, he's, that's the tribulation. Everybody in Israel, every Jew is going to make a decision, whether they will flee and, and they will be under God's protection or whether they will die. But they will choose that. Every single one of them. God's desire is that they be restored and those who refuse the restoration attempt will be destroyed with the Gentiles. That's the tribulation. This isn't God playing games. God's done. He's given mankind 6,000 years plus of opportunity given him his revelation, given him the completed word of God. The Holy Spirit's been on earth for over 2,000 years, convicting and, and all of that stuff. His church has been here doing all this. And if you're not saved, God has no sympathy. Once the rapture happens, it's wrath time. Grace time is over, wrath time is here. Okay, so who is God dealing with in the tribulation? Yeah, Jews or Israel. Second question, who's preaching the gospel in the tribulation? The church has been raptured, correct? Okay, so the church isn't there, so who is preaching the gospel? Right, no one. Well, what does Romans say? It says, how shall they hear without a preacher? That's what it says. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not heard? How shall they hear except one be sent, how, or uh, except one preach to them? How can one preach except he be sent? That's Romans chapter 10. Okay, so who's preaching the gospel? All right, well, here's, here's, the, here's the answer I get. It's the 144,000 in Revelation 7. They're preaching the gospel. Oh, really? Show me where they preach the gospel. To which I get that sound right there. Nothing. Show me what they do. Do you know that the New Testament church is the only institution in human history ever commissioned to spread the gospel? God never commissioned Israel to do it. He only commissioned the church. Here's, here's some things that are going to blow your mind as well. Israel never being tasked with evangelization and since no commissions given to these, we have no recorded commission for the 144,000 that says that they have an evangelistic duty. So there's no reason to believe they'll go about the world evangelizing. In fact, God sent prophets to foretell God's judgment where there was no opportunity for repentance. Jeremiah was one of them. Where Jeremiah said, the Babylonians are coming. They're going to take Jerusalem. We're going to be killed. People are going to starve. The city is going to be wiped out and destroyed. And there's nothing, if you repented in sackcloth and ashes today, it would still happen because you've had century after century of prophets and God is done with you. You have refused and now I'm telling you this judgment's coming that's been promised. And if you were to fall down on your face and beg and sob in tears and put on sackcloth and ashes, the Babylonians would still do every bit of damage to the city of Jerusalem and kill every bit as many people as he did before. Just read Jeremiah. That's what he said. He, for a while, he was preaching the message of, hey, there's a closing window here. You better get on the train. 
And then God told him, the window's closed. The Babylonians are coming. I'm bringing Nebuchadnezzar, and he's going to wipe you off the face of the city of Jerusalem. And they tell them that there's nothing they can do now to change that. It's happening. That's happened before. It's happened to Israel before. But it's happened other times in Scripture before as well. Here's what Jesus said of the Pharisees. Uh, or what it says of Jesus and the Pharisees, Matthew chapter 13, verses 10 and 11. The disciples came and said unto him, Why speakest thou unto them in parables? Why do you speak to the Pharisees in parables? He answered and said unto them, Because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it is not given. Verses 14 and 15 explain why. And in them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah, which saith, By hearing... Ye shall hear and shall not understand, and seeing ye shall see and shall not perceive. For this people's heart is wax gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes have they closed, lest at any time they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears, and should understand with their heart, and should be converted, and I should heal them. You know what Jesus said? He said, these people have closed their ears and closed their eyes, and they won't hear, so I'm saying, I'm telling them the truth in parables so that they cannot hear, or they can hear it, but they can't understand it, lest they be converted and I heal them. So Jesus taught people without an evangelistic purpose behind it. Is it possible that the 144,000 witnesses are there just to tell people, hey, God's judgment's coming and there's nothing you can do about it and there's no evangelistic purpose behind their preaching? Is it possible? Mm Mm-hmm. Because God sent people to preach without an evangelistic purpose before. Is there any indication in Scripture that God has any interest in evangelization in the tribulation? No, when he says things like that they all might be damned, um, that doesn't indicate an evangelistic purpose. So a lot of these things have been assumed and they've been taught and because we're too lazy to really ferret it out in Scripture, it's just easier to go with that. But I've yet to find anywhere in Scripture that tells me that there'll be anybody getting saved in the tribulation because, one, God's dealing with Israel... Two, there's nobody preached the gospel. The church is gone. The only institution ever given on earth, commissioned to evangelize, has been the church, and it's not there. Can you have evangelization without the church? No, not scripturally. Who's convicting the lost? Let's say the 144,000 are preaching the gospel. Do you know that the preaching of the gospel is useless unless the Holy Spirit is involved in the process? His job, Jesus said his job was to reprove the world of sin, to to bring conviction or to convince people that the word of God is true. So if if you're saved here tonight, at some point you heard the gospel and down deep inside you were convinced it was true and then you responded to that truth. Okay? That's because the Holy Spirit convinced you it's true. That's why people can sit and I can, I can preach and there'll be lost people over here and lost people over here and I preach the same message and the lost people over here come crashing down to the altar and they want to get saved and the lost people over here do not. Was it a failure of the preaching? No. No. These people were under the conviction of the Holy Spirit. These people might have been under the conviction of the Holy Spirit and said no. They might have been convinced it was true and rejected it. Or they might have rejected enough times that God said, I'll never bother you about this again. Which is why Jesus said, blasphemy against the Holy Spirit will never be forgiven. That's what it is. When he does his work in your heart and convinces you of the truth and you tell him, buzz off. If he says, okay, you're done. And there's no forgiveness for that because you'll never be under conviction that it was wrong in the first place. You know what the Bible says of Esau after he sold his birthright? The Bible says that he, he, there was no place of repentance found for him, though he sought it bitterly with tears. You know, there are some things that you can't undo. 
as gracious and as merciful as God is, there's some things you just can't undo. And if you reject the truth and the rapture happens, you can't undo that. Can't be done. Who's convicting on? Okay, let me, let me give you a few notes on this. So no Holy Spirit, because the raptures happened and the Holy Spirit left with the church. Say, well, doesn't the Holy Spirit come back? No. Mm -mm. No, the Holy Spirit, as we saw in Scripture, is taken out of the way. The New, church, New Testament church's mission to evangelize began, after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, Acts chapter 1, verse 8. They were commissioned to go into all the world, but they didn't actually do it until the Holy Spirit came. In fact, the disciples were instructed by Jesus to, quote, wait for the promise of the Father, which is the Holy Spirit. So for a week between his ascension and the day of Pentecost, the Bible says that they were, went up into an upper room, abode there, and continued with one accord. They didn't go evangelizing. You know why? They didn't have the Holy Spirit to do it with. Because you cannot evangelize without the Holy Spirit. So he commissioned the church, and he said, now you can't do anything with this. Just wait for the promise of the Father. Wait for the Holy Spirit. And then ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. Okay? So, the church is gone. Who's preaching the gospel? Not the church. They're gone. Who's bringing people to a convincing that the word of God is truth? Not the Holy Spirit. He's gone. Holy Spirit's job to reprove the world, John chapter 16, verses 7 to 11, and Titus 3, 5. Holy Spirit is the agent that brings people to salvation. There's zero evidence that the Holy Spirit would be sweeping the globe, bringing millions to Christ during the tribulation. There's none in the scripture. If people were being saved, think about this. If people become saved in the, in the tribulation, then they also become the temple of the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit has to come back. Or you try to have tribulation saints who are not part of the church and thus not part of the promises Christ made to the church. So they would get saved and not have the Holy Spirit. How does that work? Because the Holy Spirit is the one, he is the earnest of our inheritance, he's our down payment, and he's the one who seals us. We are sealed by the Holy Spirit un, unto redemption. So how do you have a saint without the Holy Spirit's work in his life of the sealer, the temple? So you get some really screwy ideology and some really screwy theology if you try to put saints in the tribulation. Because now the promises Jesus made to those who believe in him can't be fulfilled because they're not part of the church. Well, that doesn't make any sense to me, does it? Have you ever heard anyone explain that before? Who You've read a book on Revelation, or you've had some eschatology guy who goes around the country um, writing books and preaching, and everybody wants to come hear about the end time. He stands there and says, these are, these are the martyred saints of the tribulation, and there's more going to be coming, and then we've got the next passage in chapter 7 and 8 dealing with the, the great multitude and all that. Have you heard any of them explain how these New Testament church saints exist outside of the church during the tribulation? They can't. And they haven't thought that far. I'm not saying I'm a genius, but I don't get my theology from the books on my shelf. I get it from this book here. And I don't go to this book with a preconceived notion of what I think the Bible says and then go prove it. I go to the Bible and I say, what does it say? I don't know what it says. Tell me what your word says. And then I begin to figure out if that is true, what, what I've read and do I understand it correctly by comparing scripture with scripture with scripture with scripture. It's a time consuming. That's why I don't do this very often. This is the most time consuming study I've done in 10 years. 
I literally, in, for the 40 minutes of stuff that I give you, I have probably six or seven hours worth of study in it, and I've got 20-some years of studying the Bible under my belt for this. I've even written my own book, which I don't even agree with anymore, because as I study more, I find out, oh, I wish I had known that when I wrote my first Revelation study, because that's not true. Okay, one more question. I got one more question. If you can answer this, you win a car. It's not a good car, but you can win one. Oops. Let me go back. How does one find the truth in the tribulation? To get saved in the tribulation, you would have to overcome what God said. He said, He said, I will send them strong delusion that they might believe a lie, that they all might be damned. Does that sound like there's going to be a lot of exceptions to that, where people are going to move past? Not only do you not have the convicting Holy Spirit bringing people to salvation, but you've got got God literally making people believe dumb things. So you're telling me that people are going to push past through the fog of delusion that God has sent them to believe the lies of the Antichrist. You've got the Antichrist who does lying signs and wonders that if it were possible to deceive, would deceive even the very elect. Pushing past that and without, no, without any work of the Holy Spirit in their life and without anybody preaching the gospel to them, they're going to get saved. Come on. It makes for an easy explanation for passages you can't explain when you write a book on Revelation, but it doesn't make for good theology. And it's fraught with problems. So how do you find the truth? By the way, some will point to Joel chapter 2, you know, uh, Joel chapter 2 and verses 20. If you want to look at a passage of Scripture, uh, let's look at Joel real quick. So I want to go back to the Holy Spirit for just a second. Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, Joel. If you find Amos and Obadiah have gone too far. So people will point to this and say, no, the Holy Spirit will be at work in the tribulation. The Bible says so. Hmm. Problem is you actually have to read what it says. You can't, in, you can't just guess what it says, and you can't hope it says this. You can't wish it says it. You just have to read what it says. So they'll point to these four verses. Joel chapter 2, verse 28 down through 32. And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your old men shall dream dreams, and your young men shall see visions, and also upon the servants and upon the handmaids. In those days will I pour out my spirit, and I'll show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood. See, all these things happen in the tribulation. Before the great and terrible day of the Lord come. That's the battle of Armageddon, the second coming. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem shall be deliverance, as the Lord has said, and in the remnant whom the Lord shall call. See, the Holy Spirit will be poured out upon all flesh in the tribulation. Oh, help me. You think Joel's writing to Gentiles here? See, it says all flesh. All flesh in context. Got to put it in context. Back up one verse. Just one verse. To verse 27. And ye shall know that I am in the midst of... Who? Huh. It's almost like Joel was writing to Jews. And that I am the Lord your God and none else and my people. Who are his people? Shall never be ashamed. And it shall come to pass afterward. Who's this prophecy written to? Jews. He's going to pour out his spirit on all Jews. They will prophesy. And it shall come to pass in verse 32 that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be delivered. Who's that talking to? Jews. 
Gentiles have the opportunity, and, and this is correct, that they could, if they did call in the name of the Lord, they would be delivered, but they ain't going to because they're going to be under some strong delusion that God's going to send them. They're going to go down in flames with the Antichrist. Remember the three groups of people I said, if you don't keep those three separate, you get some really bad eschatology out of it? Joel chapter 2 is not written to the church. It's not written to those in Christ. It's written to Israel based on the covenant relationship God has with Israel. He does not have a covenant relationship. This, he does not have that covenant relationship with us. The new covenant that we are under was written in his blood. It is a new and different covenant. But the old covenant still exists for Israel. The Abrahamic, Davidic, Mosaic covenant still exists. So Joel chapter 2 doesn't promise the Holy Spirit's going to bring millions to Christ. It just, it just cannot. It's, again, if you come up with an interpret, interpretation of a scripture that leads you to a contradiction with another scripture that you have one where it's clear, 2 plus 2 is 4, and then you read another scripture that says 2 plus 2 is 7, and you're like, hmm, the 7 doesn't override the clear one, or the 2 times x equals whatever, you know, where this one's a little unclear, and I come up with my answer, and then like they used to have you do in algebra, you have to check your answer. They want you to go back and check and show your work and all that stuff, okay? Well, 2 plus 2 is always 4, so if you don't use 2 plus 2 equals 4 in figuring out what x equals, you're going to get the wrong answer. And whatever answer you come up with over here does not change the truth that 2 plus 2 is 4 over here. So when you're interpreting scripture, you can't violate something that is taught in order to come up, make an interpretation over here. It's got to all be together. Okay. So in conclusion, the New Testament age will end at the rapture. The day of grace will end with the rapture. God will now only be dealing with Israel on the basis of his covenants, and the Gentiles will be subjected to the wrath of God. And if you keep reading in chapter 6, go with me down to verse, uh, I'm sorry, back in Revelation chapter 6. If you think the world is going to be filled with millions of people rushing to get saved in the tribulation, I got bad news. If you keep reading in Revelation, that's not what it says. Verse 15, And the kings of the earth and great men and the rich men and the chief captains and the mighty men and every bondman and every free man hid themselves in the dens and the rocks of the mountains and said unto the mountains and rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of of the Lamb, for the great day of his wrath has come, and who shall be able to stand? Is running and hiding indicative of repentance? No, no. When Adam and Eve sinned, and they heard God hit the garden, what did they do? Go running up to him, fall at his feet? What did the Bible say they did? They hid. Why? Because that's not repentance. It's acknowledgement of guilt, but it's not repentance. They ran and hid. God had to coax them out of hiding. This time, they run and they hide because they know that the wrath of the Lamb is upon them. How do they know the wrath of the Lamb is upon them? My guess is somebody told them that. Well, who would tell them such a thing? I don't know, maybe there's 144,000 odd from 12,000 from all 12 tribes that get sealed in their foreheads and sent out to say, hey, this is not global warming, this is the wrath of the Lamb. Deanna, he's a liar. He's not telling you the truth. The truth is God's judging you because you receive not the truth. And you know what? They're probably going to kill those 144,000 troublemakers. And then those souls under the altar will get their vengeance because the final piece of the puzzle will be complete. So let's go back and ask the question, who are the souls in chapter 6 under the altar that have been martyred? Are they church saints? They might be. 
they're not tribulation saints. Are they Old Testament prophets and priests who were slain for the word of God and for the testimony that they held? And a lot of those. In fact, I was reading in Luke this morning, and in Luke chapter 11, Jesus referenced that. In Luke, look at Luke chapter 11. I think it's verse 50. Isn't it amazing? On, on today, when I'm getting ready to deal with this, I'm reading this very passage. Luke chapter 11, verse 50. That the blood of all the prophets which were shed from the foundation of the world may be required of this generation. From the blood of Abel unto the blood of Zechariah, which perished between the altar and the temple, verily I say unto you, it shall be required of this generation. Woe unto you, lawyers, for ye have taken away the key of knowledge. Ye entered not in yourselves, and them that were entering in ye hindered. You know, Jesus said from Abel, he, he calls Abel a prophet. And from Abel all the way to Zechariah, who was killed between the altar and the temple, he said, their blood I will require of this generation. And he's talking about the generation in the, end, in the tribulation. Just like he said, this generation shall not pass until all be fulfilled. He wasn't talking about the people living in Jerusalem in the first century. He was talking about this generation that would be there in the tribulation. So are those souls under the altar maybe... Jews and non-Jews from Abel to Zacharias and even the millions of church age saints that have perished for the name of Christ? Are they people getting saved in the tribulation and getting killed? Nah. Possible. Without violating about 30 scriptures. Impossible. Questions? We'll quit there tonight. We covered three verses. Aren't you proud? Paul. Yes. Um, they, upon getting saved, would be under the new covenant. They would become part of the church of God. Just like the Apostle Paul and Peter, they spent a lot of time talking about that in the Scripture. There's neither Jew nor Greek, bond or free, male or female, because in Christ we are one. So they, they will enjoy the new covenant. Israel, that gets restored, will enjoy the, the first covenant, the Abrahamic covenant. Does that make sense? Uh, I'm going to paraphrase and clarify. Yes. So a, a Jew today, uh, their path to salvation is not through the covenant, but through Christ. Okay. Yes, there's none other name given under heaven whereby we must be saved. Um, so if you want to be saved, you have to come through Jesus Christ. The, coven the Abrahamic covenant will not save you. It never did save you. Only Christ can. Um, where was it I was reading? Maybe that was also in Luke today. Somewhere between chapter 11 and chapter 16 or 17. Um, Jesus said the law and the prophets were until John. John the Baptist was the end of the law and the prophets. Not too long after John the Baptist was beheaded, Jesus went up into a mountain with Peter, James, and John. There was Moses and Elijah, the law and the prophets. And the Bible says the conversation was about his decease, his future execution. Um, by the way, the Bible also says the disciples were asleep while they were talking about that. They only woke up at the end. They missed the best part of the conversation. So... But Christ is the fulfillment of the law and the prophets. It always is through Christ. It always has been, always will be through Christ. So. Anyone else?
Anyone want to argue? <laughs> if I had probably almost any of my preacher friends and or any, anyone who's ever written a book on Revelation, uh, we, we would probably be arguing right now. I have never heard anyone present this. You say, well, that should tell you something, Pastor. I don't care if everybody believes something. If I can't find it in this book, I don't believe it. Period. And I think I just laid out a, about 10 reasons why you cannot have tribulation saints. Ian. Um, yeah, I'm going to give you the very short answer. That's a, I, we could spend a long time on that. Uh, they went to paradise. Jesus called it paradise. Uh, he also called it Abraham's bosom when he gave the story of the rich man and Lazarus. Lazarus went to Abraham's bosom. By the way, the rich man was a Jew too, and he went to hell. Not because he wasn't a, you know, wasn't a good enough Jew. It's because he didn't have faith in the law and the prophets. And so they went to paradise, and, and in short... After Christ was crucified, the scripture says that he preached, cap, uh, he preached to the captives, um, those that were held that couldn't go to heaven because Christ hadn't made atonement for their sin yet. He preached to them. He led captivity captive. You know, he led them into heaven by, as Hebrews 9 tells us, he went into the altar there, the, the mercy seat in heaven offered his own blood as our high priest, sealed the atonement forever for whosoever will may come. And all those saints, all those people that were in Abraham's bosom or paradise uh, through Christ were ushered into heaven. Okay, so that's the short answer. The least complicated, I can make that answer, and I'm sure it didn't totally answer your question. But if you ask me a follow-up, we're going to be here till the landing gets here. Nobody wants to be here that long. Any other questions? I'm okay with questions. Even if you don't agree with me, I'm okay with questions. You're wrong, but you know, I'm okay with your question. By the way, I used to believe these were tribulation saints because I didn't know my Bible well enough. And then years and years and years of study and learning and going, how does that match? How is that going to work? How is Go ahead, Paul. Have you ever, I assume everyone knows you're quite a baseball guy, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, do you bring baseball into it? Have you seen the natural? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, yes, I, it's been a long time, but yes, I saw the natural. You know, Robert Redford and all of them do a hitting slump, and they bring in these all the I think he did in the March, mm -hmm. trying to tell them that you know, this is the psych their way out, and Robert Redford walks out. Have you ever been in a Yeah, this dog don't hunt. <laughs> yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, my wife was with me. We were at a, at the time, it was probably the largest pastor's meeting um, in the country. We, we were, it was insisted upon us that we hadn't lived and, and haven't, haven't touched, you know, haven't touched heaven until we've been to this particular pastor's meeting. And we went. And uh, the pastor, who was you know, lauded as being this great man of God and all that, he got up and started spitting and ranting and raving. And there were a bunch of idiots down front hooting and hollering, waving their Bibles, screaming. And it felt like I was at a Nazi rally. I've seen, I've seen just about every video that was taken in the 1930s in Germany. If, if it's on film somewhere, I've probably seen it somewhere studied Nazi Germany very extent, uh, to a great extent. And I felt, I felt oppressed demonically in that room. There was probably 5,000 people in the room, maybe more, maybe eight. I mean, there's a lot of people there. And almost all of them are preachers or preachers' wives or missionaries and all that. And I felt so demonically oppressed in that room, I got up and left. 
a few years later, that pastor was arrested and sent to, sentenced to about 30 years in prison for taking an underage girl in his church across state lines besides. So, yes, yeah, so I've been to meetings where I've gotten, I, and we got up and walked out. I said, I can't deal with this anymore. This is anything but the Spirit of God as I know the Spirit of God. And time proved me correct. The sad thing is nobody else left. There was at least, I would say there was at least 5,000 other quote-unquote preachers in that room, and not one of them got up and left. They were having a great time. By the way, that preacher never opened the Bible, and while I was in the room, never quoted the Bible. He was just hitting on guys wearing earrings and women having short skirts and guys having long hair, and he was, he was hitting all of the hobby horse you know, and bless God, you need to have a King James Bible, and you need to do this, and, and, he, I mean, he's just, and he was just screaming at the top of his lungs and carrying on like you would see Hitler in one of the films, gesticulating and screaming, putting everyone in a hypnotic trance, and everybody's just, oh yeah, Heil, 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 and you know, all these preacher boys and all that down there, amen, preacher, amen, let him have it, rip it, you know, blah. and just in there 20 minutes he was carrying on that way. He never once opened this book. Now, I didn't come there to hear any of his opinions. I found out what his opinions are worth. Bucket of warm spit, his opinions. I'll take the spit. I didn't go to a preacher's meeting to have somebody scream in my face. I went to a preacher's meeting to have somebody open the Bible and preach to him. That's what's refreshing to a preacher is to be preached to. So I fly all the way now to California for the preacher's meeting, the big conference. I fly all the way out there and go through the TSA and all the other demonic forces of the world. I brave the land of fruits and nuts just to go to this meeting because that's all they do at this meeting is open the Bible and preach to you. So, Does that answer your question? What I'm saying is we don't have a lot, unfortunately, and I say this as a fundamentalist, we don't have a lot of discernment in our circles. We've got a lot of dummies in our circles, unfortunately, that do a lot of dumb things, and they hurt fundamentalism, and they give independent fundamental Baptists a bad name because they're just idiots. And they were taught by idiots how to be an idiot. You can't be that good of an idiot without some training. And I say that, I say that because some of these guys and some of these nationally known, if I gave their name, that's why I've not used any, if I said the names of the people, half of you in this room would probably know exactly who that is. And they come up with harebrained, stupid ideology they come up with new revelations. And they don't base it on anything in the Bible. I'm a Baptist. The first tenet of my faith is Bible authority. If the book doesn't teach it, I don't believe it. That's where we have to be. And I don't, don't walk out of here and say, boy, pastor's right, pastor's this. No. Go out of here and say, well, I want to get in the Bible and find, maybe study some of this out for myself. Email me this week. Pastor, what were some of the passages again? I'll say, go watch the YouTube video. Uh, leave me alone. I'm busy. Painting. Get up here and help me paint. You, you paint, I'll go study. Get you that lit. No. Um, we'll, uh, you know, Pastor, I got questions about this. You know, you, you said this, and, uh, you know, I would welcome that. I don't want you to take my word for it. I've never asked anyone to take my word for it from behind this sacred desk. Don't take my word for it. Go to this book. And if you find something that disagrees with what I said tonight, bring it to me. We'll talk about it. I'll probably still show you why you're wrong, but well, no. I'm just, no, if I'm wrong, I want to know it. I've just been studying this for too long to think I'm wrong. I've, I've looked at it all. I've heard the arguments. I've dealt with mid-trib, post-trib, amillennials. I've dealt with the 
Soul Harvest, you know, the whole Left Behind series of books was written based on the ideology that there'd be millions upon millions upon millions upon millions of people getting saved. And I say, show me that in the Bible. Oh, well, Revelation chapter 6. Set that aside, because you're, 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 you're looking at Revelation 6, and then you're deciding there's millions of souls. How, how, how do you have millions of souls getting saved? Well, Revelation chapter 6. Well, what does Revelation 6 teach? Millions of souls. You know, it's just kind of this circular argument. If you don't, okay, how are you interpreting that? Show me the scripture that points to that interpretation. Well, I can't. We date the rocks from the fossils, and we date the fossils from the rocks. We interpret Revelation 6 because we know there'll be millions of souls that get saved in the tribulation. How do you know there's going to be millions of souls saved in the tribulation? Because Revelation 6. What's your criterion for interpreting it that way? Because there's millions of souls going to be saved. How do you know? Because Revelation 6 says it. So. But how do you know Revelation 6 is saying it? Because there'd be millions, you know, just... And that's what you get. You go round and round and round and round. And I've even had older preachers I've gone to that go around the country and they preach this stuff. And I've even gone to that. I've seen their books. I've even bought some of their books. And I've read it. And I've gone, gone to them privately and said, said, I'm really having trouble with this. Would you explain this to me? And we go round and round the same circle that I just explained to you. That's all they've got. And you say, yeah, but what about the strong delusion God's going to send? Well, you know, it's not going to hit everybody. You know, that they all might be damned doesn't mean they all will be damned. Okay, well, you know, why does God even have a tribulation if, why, did he, why didn't he just bring the tribulation immediately? Or If the purpose of the tribulation is evangelism, why did he wait so long to do it? And how is he going to do it without the church and the Holy Spirit? Oh well, there'll be a, it's a different dispensation, and they'll have this, and you know it'll just be like this and like that. And, oh, really? Can you show me that in the Bible? No. Okay, so we have your opinion. Okay, got it. Well informed. I don't like to be contrary. One of my best friends in the ministry is. I described him as contrary one time. He still reminds me that I called him contrary. Just, I said, brother, I think you just like to be contrary to popular opinion. He said, I just like to read the Bible and study it and get the right answer. Right there with you. So now he's retired. Now I'm the contrary one. I enjoy being contrary, to be honest with you. All right. Um, tonight is the night we'll update our prayer list for February. If uh, you have a prayer request that you want to include and you're not here tonight, uh, please email to the church. Um, uh, we, well, we won't be in the office tomorrow morning. I don't gather. Um, but uh, assuming we're not going to be in the office tomorrow, just email to the church, and when we do the prayer list on Friday, we will have it. Uh, so try and get it in tomorrow, and we'll add it to the prayer list. Or you can, uh, I was going to say, fill out a connection card, but uh, there's some on the wall, yes. There's a big stack of them up there in the choir loft. Um, so. All right. So if you would like it, put on the prayer list. Say, Pastor, I'd like this on the prayer list tonight, and we'll, we'll add it to. Um, Saturday is the men's prayer breakfast, 8.30 to 10.30. Um, looking forward to that. If you haven't if you haven't signed up for that, let me know tonight that you're coming uh, so we can better prepare for the food. I'm going to let Mike know uh, probably in the morning how many we've got signed up for so they can go buy the food on Friday, be ready to go. So that's 8.30 to 10.30 on Saturday. Men's prayer breakfast will be in the fellowship hall. Um, and then um, we have a new member's reception Sunday night in the fellowship hall uh, after church, or probably it'll be in here. We'll probably just clear out a couple rows of pews and Put some tables up for the food and refreshments, and uh, welcome. We've had four new members join in the last uh, last few months, and so we'll welcome them in and uh, go from there. So that's what's coming up this weekend. All right, any prayer requests?